the President's remarks at the 30th anniversary celebrating the founding of the Tennessee Valley Authority from the Chemical Engineering Building at Muscle Shoals, Alabama, May 18, 1963. Mr. Chairman, Governor Wallace, members of the Alabama delegation, old friends and colleagues, Senator Hill, you, Senator Sparkman, Congressman Bob Jones, Congressman Albert Raines, Congressman Carl Elliott, all of whom have come from Washington today to take part in this ceremony. Alabama has one of the most distinguished delegations in the Congress of the United States. And I'm proud to be in a state. And I'm proud to be in a state that this outstanding group of men represents. Ladies and gentlemen, I take great pleasure in joining you on a most important anniversary for this community, this state, this region, this country. Thirty years ago today, a dream came true. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt in the presence of TVA's two great defenders, George Norris of Nebraska and Lister Hill of Alabama, signed his name to one of the most unique legislative accomplishments in the history of the United States. That simple ceremony, which took only a few minutes, ended a struggle which had gone on for a decade. It gave life to a measure which had been vetoed twice by two preceding presidents, Calvin Coolidge and Herbert Hoover. And in reality, this act of signature was only a beginning. There were many who still regarded the undertaking with doubt, some with scorn, some without hostility. Some said it couldn't be done, some said it shouldn't be done, some said it wouldn't be done, but today, 30 years later, it has been done. They predicted the government was too inefficient to help electrify the valley. But TVA, by any objective test, is not only the largest, but one of the best managed power systems in the United States. They predicted, and there are always those who predict everything against something new, they predicted that a federal regional corporation would undermine the state governments and the local governments. But state and local governments are thriving in this valley. And hundreds of state and local park and recreational areas have been set aside through the entire TVA. They predicted that TVA would destroy private enterprise. But this valley has never bloomed like it does today, and hundreds and thousands of jobs have been created because of the work that these men did before us. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody this evening to this seminar, Imagine the Future and How the $5 Trillion National Infrastructure Bank Will Create a 21st Century. So after you've seen that video and remembering what this date was about, the TVA, I'd like to pose a question early on for our experts and uh, for to come back later on during the uh, course of the seminar. I had read somewhere that the TVA was so successful that it was written into Congress or they passed a law shortly thereafter sunsetting any replica of the TVA model. So I read that somewhere. I'd like to have our uh, experts uh, fact check me on that uh, during the course of this uh, presentation. My name is Craig Sports. I am the current Wyandotte County Democratic Chair. I was a former city councilman here in Upper Sandusky from 2003 to 2007. 
And presently, or I should say more recently, I was the candidate, Democratic candidate for the 5th Congressional District going against Bob Lada in 2022. And prior to that, I ran as a state Senate candidate uh, against Bill Reinecke. And it was during that campaign that I embraced fully the idea of public banking. It was part of my uh, party uh, platform. And after when I announced for my candidacy for the congressional run, I incorporated the, not only the public banking aspect of the state public banking, but also the national banking. You know, similar to the, uh, the program that Obama first proposed in 08 when he ran for president. So I've been a fervent uh, advocate of the public banking model. I was excited to hook up with these folks from the NIB during the course of my campaign. I started getting into the local press and it was really accepted, widely accepted right away by people from all persuasions and particularly local town officials. So it's been fantastic. I mean, obviously I didn't win the race, so that's why I'm here right now, but <laughs> it's been just fantastic to be with these people and uh, to hook up with these people. Uh, We've got a great program tonight and I wanna go through these speakers real quickly. We're gonna have Alfaka Mutardi. She's a former senior economist with the IMF and she's been a, a contributor to the NIB folks for since I've been with them even before. Dr. Nomi Prinz, she's a PhD author. I've heard her speak before on this platform. She's fantastic. She's a former managing director of Goldman Sachs. Uh, we have after that, Dr. Dr. Alexander Metcalf, president, PhD, Transportation Economics Management Corporation, high-speed rail expert. Uh, we're gonna have assembly Don Guardian, former mayor of Atlantic City. We're gonna have Stanley Forcheck, former director of finance uh, for Amtrak's Northeast Co uh, Corridor. James, Lou Spencer, assistant business manager, manager UA, local 5A plumbers and gas fitters out of Virginia. Don Sifkis, uh, who's presented many times here, MIT trained chemical engineer. And then Julie Olson, uh, a fan favorite here. She is the chair of the Alaska Democratic Party Progressive Caucus out of Anchorage, Alaska. The general theme tonight is looking at the future like we talked about. Um, growing up in 1968, I went to 2001 uh, premiere, The Space Odyssey was you know, just delighted to see the movie and thought for sure by 2001, we were gonna be doing some of the things that we saw in that movie. Unfortunately, we've been wandering the desert, as we know, for the last 40 to 50 years. Tonight is not so much re uh, talking about the past, but looking at the future. And uh, with that, I want to set up Alfeca and uh, let her to take over the, the program where she's going to go over the uh, the, the bank, uh, the National Infrastructure Bank, the general overview of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And welcome to everybody. It's really great to see all of you again. And for those new folks, um, uh, what I'd like to do to set up the discussion is to talk to you about our $5 trillion public bank to lend for infrastructure projects all across the country. And since we had the last bank expire in 1957, we've been relying on budgets to pay for everything. And that has been woefully inadequate. And as a result, our infrastructure, instead of escalating and getting better, like it did under FDR and JFK, it's gone downhill. And so for that reason, we really need to have another bank to supplement our, our financing of infrastructure projects. So we had a bill in Congress uh, in the last session. It was HR 3339. Uh, what it did was to create a $5 trillion public bank to lend for infrastructure projects all across the country. Uh, we, uh, um, the, uh, the legislation is teed up and ready to be reintroduced into the current session. Uh, but uh, it's gotten a little bit slow tracked because we are earnestly, earnestly looking for uh, Republican pa partners on both uh, to, for the House bill. And we're also looking to see if we can get a Senate version of the bill introduced. All of those things take a little bit more time. We think that this is a great bipartisan effort. This is really not a bipartisan uh, piece of legislation. It's really even a nonpartisan piece of legislation. Answers the question, how can we finance infrastructure without slamming the budgets? And this is really a budgetary problem. So we've had four really large banks in our nation's past. Uh, they were very successful banks. My mouse won't work. Oh, dear. Uh, gee, here we go. 
uh, that started right after the American Revolutionary War under circumstances like this, where we had really high national debt and we had no way to build up our uh, economy and become a manufacturing center. So uh, Alexander Hamilton came along and invented this first bank of the United States, which built our first manufacturing centers. And then these others built things like our whole canal system, which was our first big transportation system. Uh, um, Abraham Lincoln uh, built the Transcontinental Railroad. And then of course, we've got lots and lots of stories for what the Reconstruction Finance Corporation did that was initiated by Herbert Hoover and then picked up by FDR and built, including the trans, the uh, Tennessee Valley uh, Authority that's been so benefited the economies of those seven states. This is a real quick explanation of how, for those that are new onto the call, how this National Infrastructure Bank works. Really quickly, it is capitalized using the Alexander Hamilton method of going to the private sector who are holding treasuries, that is our national debt, uh, for savings or investment purposes for the holder, it's an asset. And we wanna uh, see if they would like to swap that asset or sell it into the NIB in exchange for preferred stock and they'll get a little bit of extra money. Uh, we need 500 billion to capitalize our bank over time because we wanna lend out $5 trillion and we need to maintain this one to 10 ratio. So that's how we will capitalize the bank. And then the bank will go on to give out loans exactly like a commercial bank does. Uh, it'll, it will um, bring in deposits, uh, but it, each time it books a loan, it creates a new deposit and that actually adds to the money supply. So that's where the dollars come from. Uh, and then they're circulated around with cash on hand. Uh, this will provide the lowest cost financing because this is a public bank. We wanna keep financing costs down for borrowers, charging around the treasury bond rate will do that. And will lend to late state and local governments, any public entity that owns public infrastructure can come in directly to the NIB to request a loan. We cover 5 trillion in projects in 20 different infrastructure categories. So uh, this covers all of the categories that are um, monitored by the American Society of Civil Engineers. Uh, and then we added four more categories we also think are really, really important to get us into 21st century um, you know, uh, 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 infrastructure technology, high-speed rail, broadband everywhere, affordable housing, and large-scale water projects. And, and our, our speakers are going to show you how um, in, in these different areas we could build 21st century technologies. So uh, not only can we fix all of our infrastructure, all of it, but we can really supercharge the American economy, create millions of new great paying jobs, make America manufacture again, reshore manufacturing so that we won't be uh, you know, reliant on overseas supply chains, get our GDP growth up much higher than it's been, make our economy more productive uh, so our labor is put to better use, all without federal taxes, spending or deficits. Uh, and we'll reduce inflation because we'll work on the supply side to bring more supply, we'll bring the cost of goods down and offset any coming recession. We're very concerned that one is being caused by Fed policy to tamp down on the economy. That's uh, to try and uh, you know offset uh, inflation. So this is a comparison of what the NIB will lend compared to what is being provided in new additional money by the bipartisan infrastructure law that President uh, Biden passed and, and Republicans and Democrats passed a year ago. The problem is it's a great start. We, we always supported this bill, but the problem is it's simply too small to do the whole job. As far as I know, this is the only table that compares what we need with what is being provided by this bill and shows the gap between the two. Uh, it will provide only one-tenth of everything that we need, and every state will not be able to get what it needs for roads, bridges, transit, uh, rail. Uh, and there's there was a big uh, um, conference just this week. I'm sure Dr. Metcalf is going to talk about it, um, where there's not going to be enough for even for high-speed rail coming out of the bill. Drinking wastewater systems, as a result of this backlog and not being able to finance it, our infrastructure has gone downhill. So here is just in pictures to set ourselves up, what's happened to the American infrastructure, uh, um, uh, you know, um, stock of goods over time in the last 60 years since the last time we had 
a national infrastructure bank, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, and I maintain that things have really gone downhill. The first place where they've gone downhill is we spent a lot of money on Eisenhower's road program. That was great. It really boosted the economy for a while, but we have now reached the limit for roads. Here's a picture of my favorite road south of Washington, D.C. Now it's up to five lanes in both directions, toll roads everywhere, and everybody's sitting in traffic. This is hugely costly for Americans. We, cost, we spend up to $237 billion a year in congestion and wasted fuel. That's equivalent to 60 super tankers of gasoline every single year wasted in traffic. Potholed roads are another bad area. They cost uh, um, road uh, travelers millions, billions of dollars to repair uh, every year. Bridges are another area that we've seen huge uh, um, deterioration. Uh, 60 Minutes just recently in March re-ran a 2014 piece that they did on America's crumbling infrastructure. This is a picture of a bridge in uh, Pennsylvania that is so bad that the inspectors have to look at it every six months because all the rebar is rusting, the struts are, you know, could cave in any time, the cement on the deck is falling down onto the roadway below. So they had a they had to build this cover right here uh, to protect cars down below from falling debris. Uh, this is and there and three and Pennsylvania has got another three thousand uh, 300 of these bridges in similar condition. Here's a bridge with a big cracked I-beam on a major highway, I-40, going from Tennessee into Arkansas. Would you want your big semi-tractor trailer and your school bus to be going over the bridge uh, You know, at the same time together? This is very dangerous. Mass transit is another area of decline. Uh, we built a lot of mass transit starting after 1900. The, the largest mass transit system, of course, is in New York. Uh, after World War II, no, almost no improvements or additions were made to it. Uh, it fell into decline in the 1970s. Of course, this is the graffiti, you know, picture of everything. Hurricane Sandy pummeled it, or Superstorm Sandy, got salt water all into all the lines that ate away at the covers of the electricity conduits. It was a big mess and still haven't been improved and or protected from storms. Drinking water, wastewater, storm water, big sections that are not funded by the federal government. In 1970, Richard Nixon passed the Clean Air Act but uh, and had a lot of money in the budget for drinking water and wastewater systems. But over time, all of that got eliminated. We still have a huge problem all over the country, especially the central and northeast with lead service line pipes in people's front yards, uh, unsafe drinking water and lots of areas, not just poor areas like Jackson, Mississippi, but rural areas like uh, in Ohio, where we just don't have safe drinking water. New Jersey now has PFAs in their water and they need new filtration systems to get all those forever chemicals out of their drinking water. The power grid has seen also a 60 year decline. Uh, every time we have a new storm caused by global warming that just disrupts all of this distribution system, uh, the grid is maxed out. Uh, last summer, we had really high temperatures and heat, and we had brownouts and that not the provision of electricity we want in California and Texas and a lot of other places. And of course, here's my favorite little guy with a plug looking to plug, plug in the new uh, renewable energy and no place on the grid to plug it in. The grid is not ready for any of these things, and we have a lot of money in our bank to uh, spit this up. So um, we're st I'll stop there and turn it over to the next speakers who will talk to you about the vision that, the, the, uh, that we can do for America with this National Infrastructure Bank to improve all of our nation's infrastructure. Thank you. It's like I said before, you know, we know, we know a lot of these mistakes in the, in the past, uh, transgressions, everything else. We've got to be thinking about how we're going to be freeing ourselves going forward. Uh, what I like to call from this bondage of uh, this uh, outmoded thinking, outdated technology and everything. So that's uh, that's our task. So I want to bring forward uh, Dr. Nomi Prince. I've heard her speak before. I really, I really uh, liked uh, you know, her presentation. And uh, I just want to turn it over to you, Dr. Prince. Go ahead. Um, thank you. And, and I got to say, Alfeca, every time I see you present the logic, the information, and the just degradation of our infrastructure now in photos as well as numbers. I just wanna 
as I'm sure we all do, walk into every congressperson's office and be like, what is wrong with you? Let's sign this, let's get it done. The reality is we have an immense amount of project work. There's nobody in Congress that doesn't know that. There's no office you can go into where someone can't give you a list of all the things they cannot get done in their state or in their locality because they do not have the funding to go all the way from A to B. It gets stopped at sort of like A.1. Um, and, and, and this is really where we come in. But since the last time I was able to join you and, and thank you for having me back, it's always just wonderful to share the, this this sort of energy that we have and energy is obviously a big part of infrastructure as well. Um, we've had a bunch of banks crash. Um, and the reason that is important and the reason it goes back to money the National Infrastructure Bank and the Fed is because these things are not unconnected. So very briefly, in like a minute, I just want to sort of overview what has happened while the Fed was busy fighting inflation, which is another way of saying fighting supply chain growth and economic growth and wages. And what has happened since the last Fed hike recently of 25 basis points to get us to a, a rate target of federal funds rates between five and five and a quarter, the fastest rate hike absolute amount of increase in since the, since the um, 80s, is that we have had a number of bank failures. Why have we had bank failures? And this ties directly into the NIB. We've had bank failures, not just because they were all um, unable to manage the sort of lax amount of regulations that they were subjected to, and that's a whole other topic, it is because in order to provide liquidity to their depositors, to so the people and the companies that had money at their banks, they held treasuries, U.S. government bonds, our debt in reserve against those deposits. When depositors started very quickly, very quickly in the last quarter of last year and even before that, taking their money out of these mid-sized banks that were paying next to no interest for these deposits, so no reason to keep money with them. At the same time, treasuries were declining in value because rates were rising, simple bond map. What that meant was that banks like Silvergate, banks like Silicon Valley, banks like First Republic, now banks like PacWest, Key Corp, I could go on, there's about 10 banks that are on the brink of potential failure right now in the mid-tier is because for multiple reasons, depositors have withdrawn their money not immediately, but actually over time. This has been evident to the Fed as they have been increasing rates to, quote, fight inflation. The degradation of their treasuries has increased. They don't have the liquidity to sell those treasuries at where they were going to sell them in order to make up cash, in order to pay depositors leaving. Depositors keep leaving. There's a run. Banks collapse. And they all get bought by JP Morgan Chase. OK, not all of them, but first, a <laughs> First Republic Bank ha ha has gotten bought by by J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, that is not something that has not happened in the past. J.P. Morgan Chase once bought my old firm, not my own personal firm, but the firm I worked with, Bear Stearns, um, and wanting to pay two dollars on um, for, for their shares as opposed to the sixty two dollars they had been valued at a week before J.P. Morgan offered two. the point being that what's happening is our mid tier banks are flailing, not just because of mismanagement, but actually because of Federal Reserve policy. They do not have the money to raise, in or they, they cannot get the money to raise to pay depositors leaving by selling treasuries at degraded values. What that means is big banks like JP Morgan Chase, I'll just use that as an example, this entire next few minutes, when it comes up, get to buy them and get to buy them with Federal Reserve support. When the Federal Reserve just raised rates recently for 25 basis points, Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell was asked specifically by a reporter as to whether he was concerned by the fact that one of the biggest banks, one of the biggest too big to fail banks, I should say, JP Morgan Chase just got a little teeny bit bigger because it wasn't doing its regulatory policy and ultimately because of its monetary policy. Um, he punted. He, he literally hemmed and hawed and kind of blamed other regulatory bodies. Well, actually it is the Fed's purview to make sure the banks are stable. This is all why we cannot trust the banking system to be there, to be able to lend, because not only does it have problems with its choices, i.e. JP Morgan not deciding to help to fund that last A to B moments of a new bridge or of a high-speed rail or of a new power grid or whatever it might be within a state or across states, um, but because it coddles these banks when other banks who can't do it fail. 
So, so there are multiple levels through which our current private banking system simply cannot, will not, and will never be able to accommodate our infrastructure funding. Now, going back to treasuries degrading, in the entire time we have been talking about the National Infrastructure Bank, over the last time it was introduced and over now trying to get a Republican on board and trying to reintroduce it with all the names that we have and all the names we will hope to get um, in the near future, the reality is we have had a degradation in treasuries. Had we done this when we first wanted to do this, we'd be up and running, we'd have the value, we'd have monetized projects, and, and we would be getting deposits. A lot of the banks that have failed, and now they are trying to up their percentage that they pay for those deposits to try to maintain them, but it's a bit late. They borrowed a lot. They've, again, degraded the value of liquidity and so forth. Um, they were paying 10 basis points, 20 basis points. First Republic was paying 50 basis points at the most on high grade deposits, savings accounts. That is not enough to incentivize people to save with those banks. And it's certainly not, not enough to use those assets as collateral to fund infrastructure projects, certainly not $5 trillion worth of them. Meanwhile, the other thing that's happened is we have ongoing squabbling about the debt ceiling. Our debt's pretty high. We've been above the ceiling for months. Not a lot, but there's certainly sort of little mechanics and tinkering that are going on at the hands of the Treasury Department to try and make it look like we're not actually over our debt cap, which we actually are. But the reality is, well, while our elected officials are, are like, you know, going through three theatrics and, and again, squabbling about what future needs they want to horse trade in order to pay for today's budget and to raise the debt ceiling, which we can't even use to accommodate all the infrastructure needs that we have, certainly not that $5 trillion that we need to look at right away. Um, we could have been, again, done with this um, and monetize some of that debt and used it for the purposes, um, as Alfeca outlined so well and always does, to seed fund this National Infrastructure Bank. None of that makes any sense. But the next time we have this conversation, I predict another bank is going to fail. I predict there's either going to be more squabbling or we're going to raise the debt ceiling. Neither one of those scenarios is going to necessarily be a way in which we can fund the infrastructure that we need to fund in order to get the five trillion or any portion of it done beyond the bipartisan infrastructure law. So we, we keep on going into these scenarios where things actually get worse on the financial side as they're obviously not getting better on the infrastructure side. Um, and so we're at a moment right now, and I keep, every time I talk to you guys, I'm like, we're at a moment right now. We're at another moment right now where it makes eminent sense to, to walk into anyone's office and be like, look, which, which one of these things doesn't make sense to, you, sense to you? Which one of these bridges don't you wanna fix? Which one of these power grades don't you wanna upgrade? Which one of these train um, systems don't you wanna make better? Which one of these broadband scenarios don't you want to go out to more people? It, and, and none of them will say, I don't want that stuff to happen. What they will say time and time again is we don't have the money. Again, all we are doing here is giving them that solution at a time where all of the factors that are driving us to this point, and out of the history that we have of positivity um, to get a public or national infrastructure bank or mechanism to fund all of these projects is right there um, in front of them. So I, I know from my standpoint, I remain fully committed to, to doing whatever I can to help with this initiative. I, I am so glad that more people continue to join and see the, the sheer logic of it, the sheer numbers, again, in the face of everything else that's going on. And I have to reiterate, there, there is no better time than now to, to pound on the tables of these people that we have elected um, to get this done on a federal level. Yeah, I can't say enough about that. I mean, the other thing too is, it's like you mentioned about the budget, uh, talks right now, they don't even talk about raising taxes. You know, just simple raising the taxes uh, in, a, in a bipartisan way, you come to an agreement, but you've got to be bringing in revenue. Look, they haven't even raised the highway, uh, the gas tax, the federal gas tax has been raised a decade, so the highway trust fund is depleted. Yeah, so... <laughs> I want to, you know, keep going on on a positive note. So I want to have Dr. Metcalf come up next and talk about uh, high-speed rail and how we're going to finally start getting it here with this new bill. Well, thank you very much for inviting me in to talk about high-speed rail. Uh, what I'd like to do is to, in a few minutes, try and give you uh, an update on what the potential 
investment could be in high-speed rail and why we can basically now do it, whereas probably in the past we couldn't. I got first introduced to the idea of um, high-speed rail for America back in the 1980s when I was working as chief economist of British Rail and the European railroads all wanted to know whether or not there was a chance they could come and sell their trains to America. And I go to the first slide. Uh, the situation back in 1980 was that when we looked at the opportunities for high-speed rail in America, it was very, very uh, small opportunity. Uh, clearly, most of the opportunities lay within what we later learned were the mega regions. And uh, basically, it was the Northeast Corridor, some stuff around Chicago, a little bit down in Florida, maybe Texas, and something maybe in, in California. So the markets were not really there for high-speed rail in 1980. So the, what happened was that a, a dramatic changes occurred between 1980 and now. And it's those dramatic changes that have made all the difference to the potential for high-speed rail. Next slide. Okay, so when we look at high-speed rail today, what we're saying is there is enormous potential. There is the ability to connect 85% of the American population and to build a network which has got very similar kind of geography to the interstate system, uh, 15,000 mile system that would basically connect all the major cities and a lot of the small towns uh, along the along the way. It's there. So basically, this network that we're talking about would cost about a trillion dollars, similar perhaps to what the interstate cost over 20 years in which it would take us to build it. What I've done is color code the network so we can see which should come first, second, third, and fourth, and in, in a, give you the ability to understand what exactly the nature of that network would be. Why has this network emerged from basically a situation where there was no case at all for really building high-speed rail outside the mega regions? The reasons, perhaps we could go to the next slide, are really very straightforward. The first one was the decision to deregulate the airlines. What this meant was the airlines would no longer Firstly, they abandoned 40 uh, major cities in the US through deregulation. And secondly, they don't any longer want to fly, fly any distance that's less than 400 miles. So this created a big vacuum in terms of your ability to travel between cities and places in, in the US. The second was the development of huge amounts of congestion on the highway network. Back in the 1980s, you know, the congestion levels on most of the intercity highways was relatively low. Today, it's really built up. And if we look at I-95 on the East Coast, or we look at I-5 on the West Coast, or we look at 94 around Chicago, we find the same kind of picture that Alpha, uh, uh, Alpha had mentioned as being a major problem. The third thing was that gas prices rose dramatically in America. Um, you know, it's hard to remember that in 1999, a barrel of oil was only $19 a barrel. Today, that barrel of oil is going to cost you somewhere, depending on what sta state of the year it is, somewhere between, you know, something like $70 to $90 a barrel, and at bad times when there's shortages of supply, $140 a barrel. So this increase in price of oil has really uh, hit the motorist and has basically created it, made it much more expensive to drive your car to go uh, and travel on any given holiday in, in the US. The fourth thing and the final thing that's really been important is that the technology associated with rail has dramatically evolved. And as a result, we've gone from speeds in the 1980 
of 125 miles an hour maximum speed for a train. And, you know, just two generations ago on Amtrak, we had trains that were had that kind of capability to trains that today can do 240 miles an hour and are much faster and much more competitive so that not only are they today competitive with the automobile, but they're also competitive with air. When you take all the travel time associated in going door to door between any two places. So this has remarkably changed the market. Why am I sure the market has changed? Let's look at the next slide. What we're showing here is the way that Amtrak's, the demand for riding passenger trains on Amtrak, a system that really, apart from in the Northeast Corridor, has not really uh, had great improvements in service between the year 2000 and the year 2019, increased its demand by 50%. I was amazed that the Wall Street Journal wasn't putting that up as a headline because it's absolutely amazing that Amtrak would have achieved a 50% increase in its average for the whole system, for the whole system. And that includes all the commuter lines and all the long distance lines they run and the intercity lines as well. On average, the increase in ridership on the intercity lines is often well above 100, maybe even nearly 200% over that period of time. So there has been a great surge in the market for high-speed rail. And that is a, a truly remarkable fact due to things like gas prices, congestion, and air deregulation. So we have evidence that the uh, ridership for high-speed rail is dramatically increased. And if we were to increase the quality of service that we could provide for moving from Amtrak, to high-speed rail, as they're going to try and do in the Northeast Corridor, then we would see even greater increases and we'd see major diversion from automobile and from air into onto the intercity system. Okay, so this is really a dramatic change over 40 years between what we had back in the 80s, you know, 60s and 80s to today. So we've got a very, very different market that we're dealing with. This market has increased dramatically and it is a really major change that I don't think most people have really noticed <laughs> over the last 40 years. So let's have a look at the next slide. Okay, there are three things that have been done by successful uh, high-speed rail systems. And the, the most successful system in the world today is the Japanese system. And the Japanese financial model is built on three key legs that generate the revenue that allow it to declare itself profitable in terms of both operating and capital costs each year. And basically that's the passenger market, it's the express parcel market and uh, uh, the property market. Those three markets together make JNR which is the most uh, well-performing of the Japanese railroads, a profitable operation and one that's admired by all the guys who run passenger rail all around the world. They all have to go and see what the Japanese have done because they have really shown that this can be a very powerful business, employ a lot of people, create a lot of income, and at the same time, meet financial and economic uh, goals so that it is not only just showing a return on capital, but actually being able to provide a lot of economic benefits in the corridors in which it's built. Next slide. This is a graphic that shows for the Pacific Northwest, the Cascadia High-Speed Rail Project that we've been working on for a number of years, what each of those businesses contributes to their ability to cover capital costs. So if you look on the left-hand side of the graph, you can see that basically the passenger business on its own can only cover about 30% of the capital cost. So if I take a 220 mile an hour train today and get a nice track, uh, one actually much nicer than the Northeast Corridor, which has got a lot of curves in it, uh, I can probably cover 30% of my capital cost. 
if I add the express freight business, and remember, the express freight business is a very rapidly growing business. All those parcels that are getting all uh, arriving on your doorstep and going away again are basically a part of that market. It's a huge growth, 15, 16% a year growth in moving parcels around America. If we use, look at that business, then basically we could probably cover between 70 and 80% of our capital costs. So we run passenger trains during the peak times of the day, you know, like, you know, that, that early morning airplane you have to go and get to get to Dallas from Washington. Basically, if we uh, run passenger in the peak hour and express parcels in the off peak hours, then we can probably cover 70 or 80% of our capital costs. That is a huge change. And you'll find it very hard to persuade a load of bankers that basically uh, that could be done. They believe in the freight market, they just don't believe in the passenger market. But the third leg of our stool is uh, transit-oriented development. Transit-oriented development is a very big profit maker for, for, for JNR. JNR makes a lot of money because around its stations, it's been able to capitalize on the increased value associated with everybody being able to, to get to those stations and move around from those stations. Let's have a look at the next uh, uh, slide. So the first market, our express parcel, if we could take all the uh, trucks that are running around our interstates uh, with, uh, with parcels on them, and there are a lot of truck trains being run around the different uh, uh, interstates, then we um, put that on the rail, we could really, really help because, you know, uh, the truck trains are responsible for a fair bit of that truck traffic that is, is out there. Next slide. And I mentioned the property market. On the uh, uh, proposal for the Pacific Northwest, we've talked about developing a, a major property development at every city along that corridor. This is the Portland Rose Quarter, an area that needs urban renewal. And basically we would be able to develop something equivalent to about a 40 block area and produce major improvements. On the right, I'm showing you Kings Cross Station, London, where we put up a 150 mile an hour train. And in that it became a $16 billion property development program. So if you want to rebuild bits of uh, the urban environment around America, high-speed rail is definitely going to help. I mean, what this has done is 25 large office buildings, 20 new streets, 10 new public spaces, restoration or refurbishment of 20 historic buildings and structures, and 2,000 homes, including affordable homes that could be put into that space. So if you next time you go back to London or go to London, sorry, I'm the guy goes back sometimes, then basically you'll be able to take a look around some of the station developments that have occurred because you've put in high speed rail. So it's the next slide. It's those three businesses that can make all the difference. If it's done with a public private partnership, and if in fact we can guarantee the first contributions. Remember, when you do any project, the first dollar that you get is the hardest to get because once the market sees that there's willing investors, they will become part of it. We will be able to combine money that we can get from an infrastructure bank with money from the private sector, and we can produce a system that will give us the kind of intercity travel we want. Imagine being on a train like the one I'm showing on the right, rather than cramped up on Southwest as you fly to Dallas from Washington. So what I'm telling you is that if we can uh, organize uh, the institution to allow us to run public-private partnerships with good capital investment, then in effect, we would be able to build that 15,000 mile system uh, today across America. And that would be a major achievement. It would take us 20 years. It will be similar to the interstate highway system, but it will save dramatically because of the environmental benefits, the use of electrification, and all the good things that go with running a high-speed train versus a diesel-driven train 
which most of Amtrak trains are in fact today. So we, we really think that it's arrived. In 1980, no, we couldn't have done it. But today, yes, we could absolutely do it. And the market is there. It's just a matter of us having the ability to invest the dollars to build a system. And with that, thank you. It's unfortunate in this country, we once had the largest passenger rail system in the world, and we let it go. And Europe, uh, meanwhile, has never let go of their triad of transportation. They have great highways, good rail systems right in the center of towns, like you talk about. Those are the bustling, bustling city centers where a lot of, a lot of you know, things just take place. Uh, I lived in Munich, Paris, London, and I've seen, you know, I've seen all the city centers. So on that though, it's a good segue because we're gonna bring up uh, Stan next, uh, who is the Director of Finance uh, for Amtrak. So uh, Stan, take it over. Thanks so much, I appreciate it. I, I hope everybody has enjoyed the speakers so far and I'm gonna to try to be as quick as possible. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, I uh, spent over 30 years with Amtrak. I was the first Director of Finance for Amtrak's Northeast Corridor and uh, uh, spent some time in the energy consulting business. Uh, I am considered an expert witness in uh, three of the grids here in the Northeast. Uh, uh, and so far as transportation or transit organizations versus uh, electric energy. So I, I wanna get started. Uh, uh, let, me, let me get the slides up here. I'm gonna talk a little bit about infrastructure infrastructure, not necessarily the National Infrastructure Bank, which will I, I will get to at the very end. Uh, but I want to talk about upgrading and building infrastructure and why we want to do it. Before we can answer that question, I've been talking to a lot of people over the last three, four years regarding infrastructure, and you would be very surprised to find out that most people don't understand what all what what infrastructure is or what makes up infrastructure i know we talked about high speed rail alfeca mentioned water distribution water supply and we talk about these things all the time but exactly what makes up infrastructure uh and and to be very honest with you infrastructure is just about everything that we have in this country and it, it is in such poor condition uh, that uh, we need to constantly mention it from not only a financial uh, uh, point of view, but also an operating point of view. And the, the real issue that I, I want to bring out is why do we have to worry about infrastructure? All of these things, no matter what they are, have to be uh, dealt with. And if we can go to the next slide, we would see that infrastructure, no matter what it is, is consistently aging. The average age of infrastructure in this country is about 85 years old. We tend to move forward on projects without totally integrating projects with each other so that they become segregated. They, they don't integrate well. That means that they don't work together well. We don't consider changes or we haven't considered changes in the environment so far in all of our infrastructure. That And the bulk of that has been over the last 85 to 100 years old. You know, one of the things that we never think about is in our urban areas, schools are more than 85 years old. The city of Philadelphia has schools that are 100 years old. New York's got the same thing. All major urban areas have that. We've been upgrading in small pockets. We've been actually putting Band-Aids on major projects, but we never worry about the total infrastructure picture. And probably the most important thing as to why we have to worry about the nation's infrastructure is that there's no consistent review, evaluation, or processing of inspection results. Let's look over the course of the last few months. We've had trains derail, even though that we've inspected the track, even though the warnings were given to the engineer and trains derail. 
We've had buildings in New York, Miami, and a lot of other cities where inspections were made, gigs were found out, and a, a gig is means it didn't pass a test. I, I got asked that question, what is a gig? Uh, I guess uh, when you're in the military or if you're in an operating uh, group, a gig is really just what I said. It's a, uh, a miscue. Uh, you didn't pass inspection. But look at the buildings that fall down and, and uh, actually have mortalities when they fall down. It doesn't matter what city, it's, it's out there. So these things are constantly happening. I'll bet you that in any week, any day, an inspection is made somewhere in the United States, whether it be a small water system, whether it be a bridge over a small creek, whether it be a larger bridge. Alfeca has shown you uh, two bridges that how could they pass inspections and still have people ride that, ride underneath and on top of them? So we have things that are failing, and that's why we have to protect our infrastructure. We need to evaluate that. And, we, and, and one of the things that happens when we evaluate uh, those inspection gigs, we find out that those municipalities, those communities, those cities don't have enough operating money. They don't have enough people work in their public works department to actually go out and fix any of these, these little problems. And when we have, everybody knows when we have a little problem, it soon becomes a bigger problem because we let things go. And that's what we've done here. For the last 60 and 70 years, we have let things go. We fix the big items. We fix the big bridges, we fix the tunnels, we fix different things like that, but we don't worry about the small little water systems, the small little bridges. We don't worry about things like that. So let's move on to the next slide. Most infrastructure in this country is hiding in plain sight. There's water systems on the left. I mentioned freight railroads. There's, there's a yard right there that they put trains together and they're constantly monitoring the brakes, the shoes on, on the brakes, the trucks on those trains. They're always monitoring them. They're always monitoring the tracks, but if they get gig, they don't necessarily go out and fix them right away. The same is true of the buildings that are out there. And there's a small girder bridge that's right there no one knows, has it been inspected? No one knows if it's passed. No one knows anything about it until something happens. Electric distribution is the same thing, all right? Electric distribution, I'm gonna talk about energy in a little while, but electric distribution is imperative in this country because that's the way everything moves. That's the way everything grows. Broadband is up there. There are pockets within certain states where there is no broadband. Vermont right now is going through a tremendous exercise to put in brand new broadband systems for the northernmost portions of that state. The same is true of the northernmost uh, uh, states in the Great Lakes region, because people, people live there, they need broadband to get anything done, but we don't have it everywhere just like we have pockets of people that don't have running water in this country. So infrastructure is hiding. We don't see it because nothing is happening on a daily basis. And it could even be, as Dr. Metcalf uh, uh, spoke just a little while ago, transit systems. We, we want high-speed rail. Uh, Dr. Metcalf, I, I, I started a little bit before you with Amtrak. We were thinking in terms of the late 70s to get to high-speed rail, but we never got it because there's a lot of other things that are taking place. I will tell you this, your model is, is being used right now in the state of Wisconsin to put in uh, a commuter high-speed rail system from Chicago all the way up into the uh, northernmost cities. And it's the same model and it, it actually works. If we could move on uh, to the next slide, 
we want to talk a little bit, bit about the electricity supply cross, uh, crisis. And there are three crises that are happening simultaneously. We have generation shortages, we have transmission shortages, and we have distribution system shortages. It's not the fact that they're falling apart. It's not the fact that they're too small. It's a fact that we are transitioning and moving too quickly without determining the, the solid strategy and understanding of expansion procedures and planning. And why are we doing that? Because we're rushing to get things done. Last week, comments by the FERC commissioners were uh, uh, before Congress mentions the fact that we're uh, transitioning too quickly. NERC came out earlier this week with a report on the same issue. We're rushing too quickly to get anything done. We want to say that, that we want to have fossil fuels and everything like that, but yet we're increasing. Uh, we want to eliminate fossil fuels, but yet we're increasing the use of fossil fuel generation, fossil fuel transmission. We're increasing it because the level of electricity needed is expanding. And the only way you can do it is to continually use fossil fuels. In the pictures I have below, I want to make a couple comments. We heard JFK's speech regarding the TVA. And there is the signing of the TVA resolution and bill uh, by FDR. Uh, and it is uh, up there for a reason. Because the TVA, over the course of the next few months, said uh, basically that the moratorium on natural, natural gas generation for electricity uh, is not, not the right way to go. And they're building natural gas uh, generation facilities to support the future. So TVA is basically moving forward with that. The second slide is a combination of generation, part nuclear and part uh, um, uh, natural gas. And I put that up there because uh, I want to take a step back to make this step forward. And that is this. Back in the 1970s, excuse me, the 60s and 70s, the United States came up with the approach that we would have a fleet of nuclear generation that would support electricity development through the 21st century. And because of certain things that took place in the 80s, a moratorium was put on it and we changed the complexion of what we really wanted to do as far as generation is concerned. Because we wanted to have <laughs> nuclear generation throughout the country. And if we had nuclear generation and we didn't become scared about nuclear generation, then would we really need to do the things we're doing now? Because it would have already taken place. We would have already eliminated fossil fuels because we would have been nuclear. We wouldn't have to do some of the things that we're doing now. The next picture demonstrates the transmission system. Again, it's capacity short, and so is the distribution system. Again, there's nothing wrong with what we have, but we're using more and more electricity. And we're saying to ourselves, we need more and more electricity, but our transition is going to take too long. And the people who want to move in that area don't understand expansion policies that all the grids have. Example, we had a problem in Texas two years ago. Texas wants to be an independent grid. They don't want to have tie lines that the other grids have. New York's grid, the New York ISO, is 20% short on electricity. 20% short. That means that they take an equal amount from the PJM, which is the Pennsylvania, Maryland, going to Ohio, going to Illinois, and they, they have tie lines and it comes from there. And then ISO New England also gives it to New York coming from the East. Texas is not like that. It creates problems. 
but we have to expand what we have. And it's easy to expand that, but we have to follow the FERC rules and the individual grid rules to make that expansion. The last slide, or the last picture, I'm sorry, is an energy storage facility. If you look at it, and Amtrak started looking at this in 2006, 2007. That building looks like a large warehouse. It's pretty big. The storage capacity on that building is five megawatts. Dr. Metcalf knows this. When you have an Amtrak, a Sela train, or even the Northeast Regional train, and it stopped in New York City in Penn Station, to go from a stop to start moving takes 10 megawatts to start moving. That storage unit can't even do half of that. So you can imagine that as we get further and further in different ways to support our generation, we're going to see that we're going to need building after building and building to support the storage that's really need for everything that we've got. Another thing, we want to go to electric buses. I've been working on a project for New York City to take 5,500 buses and convert them to electric buses. They have to be charged twice a day. That's 5,500 buses charged twice a day. That's a strain on any electric system. The next slide, we talked about energy and probably the most important thing in infrastructure that we have is security, cybersecurity. Most of the infrastructure we have in this country is supported by security systems. All right. And those security systems were put in on installation of that infrastructure, and most of them have never been updated. At the same time, we're not updating our cybersecurity for all of our systems, then cyber terrorists are out there and they are constantly updating their hacking abilities. That's another piece of infrastructure that we should be worried about because we don't want cyber terrorists out there that can hack into our systems that can control the chemicals that go into our water supply, that can control the, the uh, transmission of power, the generation of power, the distribution of power, actually monitor our trains, monitor our highways. We don't need cyber terrorists. And cyber terrorists are not the kind that go around shooting into substations. These are people that you can't see that will get there, that they're constantly upgrading. My last slide, I believe, is extremely important from the standpoint that the National Infrastructure Bank is literally a platform. It's a platform to do many things. It's not just to lend money or create banking operations. It's actually an engineering group which can review everything as it comes into the platform. We can review overall projects to include economics and a budget. We can make sure that people on a community level can get the best project for what they want to do. It can do everything. It could look at economical sourcing of parts and manufactured goods for our projects. We can ensure that every project meets the criteria. We also have a regulatory section, which will not only look at the regulations necessary for each individual project by community, city, township, and state, we can look at it from the opposite point of view. Right now, this country is overregulated. We need to streamline regulations, and what better place? 
to look at the regulations is within the National Infrastructure Bank, because now we can see, is this really needed or not needed? And then lastly, we have banking operations that actually makes the final approval on our projects, make sure that we have the funding levels and we can manage everything that's out there. It's very important that people understand that. We have a group of individuals who are now working with every community that's out there and building up a checklist and a concept of what projects need to be done. The infrastructure law, which Alfeca mentions that we really appreciated that it got done, is not enough. And what's happening is we're making communities compete for the money that's out there. And some of them are losing and they're not gonna get it done. We do not want that to happen with a national infrastructure bank because we want to do every project and the country deserves that. We need the new infrastructure. And remember, infrastructure is everything that's out there. Thanks so much for your time. I hope you're getting something out of this. Greg, Greg, you're on mute. Yeah, I kept flipping that back and forth. I was waiting for Stan to finish up. But no, thank you, Stan. We did get a lot out of that. I appreciate that. I want to bring in Lou Spencer right away. Good evening. Uh, my name is Lou Spencer. I'm the assistant business manager with United Association Local Union Number no. 5, Plumbers and Gas Fitters. We operate in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area, including Southern Maryland and all of Northern Virginia. In fact, I just pulled off of Interstate 95 to uh, to hop on this call. Uh, I am very involved in workforce development in Northern Virginia and uh, recently in, participated in an all-day inaugural event for the Governor's Workforce Development Hub. And during that, uh, that professionally facilitated event, we wanted to define the best ways, the things that we needed to look at to make Virginia the number one place to work, to live and work. And um, again, this event was professionally facilitated and the survey showed that the number one thing was broadband. We need broadband throughout the state of Virginia. Virginia is not alone. There's many places in the country. Uh, I live in an area of Virginia, which uh, is short on broadband and it doesn't look like it's going to be coming to my neighborhood anytime soon. The National Infrastructure Bank will take care of that. The other thing that came out of the survey is people require more flexible work schedules. And again, broadband will help with uh, allowing pay, uh, parents to have flexible work schedules. And of course, when you're talking about Northern Virginia, you have to talk about traffic. Uh, it's something we're dealing with in Northern Virginia. Uh, we've got to figure out a way to get mom and dad home and we've got to get mom and dad to the daycare, to the soccer game, and back home again to finish the homework. Um, traffic congestion is bad in Northern Virginia. It's bad in metropolitan areas all around the country. The National Infrastructure Bank will help resolve these problems. The National Infrastructure Bank, Bank will give us uh, broadband. It'll give us uh, relief and traffic congestion, better roads, better bridges, better rail, uh, better airports, and um, so many other things, such as wastewater treatment plants, a stronger electric grid, and better waterways. Uh, we've got to allow employees and employers to uh, pre perform their work more professionally and allow manufacturers to get their product to market quicker. Um, the National Infrastructure Bank is a great thing to increase productivity and move this economy forward. Thanks for listening this evening. Thank you. Next, I'm going to bring, uh, I think uh, Don Sipkis is going to be up next. And despite uh, the recent, uh, I think, respite the, the West has got with all the rain and everything, we still got some long-term problems uh, with the infrastructure out there to respect to the water issues. So, uh, Don, take it over, please. Okay, in the next few minutes, I'm going to talk to you about the crisis on the Colorado River, why it's so important and a possible solution that the NIB could help with. 
what you're looking at is the lower basin of the Colorado River system. There's a lot of dams and lakes on this system, but there are three that are very important. The Glen Canyon Dam in northern Arizona that forms Lake Powell, Hoover Dam in southern Nevada that forms Lake Mead, and the Parker Dam on the border between California and Arizona that forms Lake Havasu. The way it works is <clears throat> Wyoming and Colorado and Utah on the western slope of the Rockies, water flows down from snowmelt and other smaller rivers to Glen Canyon. Glen Canyon releases water, goes through the Grand Canyon, Grand Canyon down to Lake Mead, and from there, Hoover Dam releases water down to Lake Havasu, where thousands of gallons of water a second are sent west of Los Angeles through the Colorado River Aqueduct, where my cursor is, and through the Central Arizona Project over to Phoenix and Tucson. What's the problem? The problem is very low water levels in Lake Mead and Lake Powell due to the 20 year mega drought that we've been in. This is a late picture, uh, a recent picture from Lake Mead. Here's a recent picture of the back of the Glen Canyon Dam in Lake Powell. And <clears throat> right now, Lake Mead is at, whoops. Right now, Lake Mead is 70% empty or 30% full. <laughs> and Lake Powell is 27% full or 73% empty. There's a total shortfall. And these two lakes, which are critical to supply water to Phoenix, Tucson, Las Vegas, and Los Angeles, of 11.5 trillion gallons of water. The scientists that study this every day were afraid last year that both Lake Powell and Lake Mead were going to hit the dead pool level. That is a very dangerous situation because it means they could not produce electricity. And without electricity, you don't have water pumps. To allow those two dams to go to the dead pool level means you're threatening the water supply for 40 million people, thousands of farms, and $30 billion in annual food production. And that's not just annual food production for the southwestern part of the United States. It's annual food production for the entire country since it gets shipped all over the place. Now, what's the solution to this? The solution to this is we need to get more water to Lake Powell so it can flow downstream and ultimately supply Lake Havasu to keep the system going. We would need 5.7 trillion gallons of water just to get those two lakes to 50% capacity, which would help a tremendous amount if we could do that. Now, is there some place in the United States that contains 5.7 trillion gallons of water where no one has a claim to it? Yes, there is one place. It's this entire watershed of the Mississippi River. Everything between the eastern slope of the Rocky Mountains and the western slope of the Appalachian Mountains from New York all the way down to Alabama drains down to the Gulf of Mexico. There are two outlets only to the Gulf of Mexico. 70% of all that water goes down the main channel of the Mississippi past New Orleans into the Gulf. The other 30% goes down the Atchafalaya River into the Gulf of Mexico. Where is the Atchafalaya River? The Atchafalaya, the uh, Atchafalaya River starts right here, about 300 miles up from New Orleans. The official name of it is the Atchafalaya Basin Floodway. It's about 100. The uh, the delta is about 100 miles west of New Orleans, and this is controlled by the Army Corps of Engineers, which built this huge monster structure. It's amazing to see. I've been on the river and I saw it. Uh, dams, levees, uh, pipes, uh, everything, they control that 70-30 ratio, and they look at it every single day. Now, the thing about the water in the, the Chafalaya River is that it has no commercial usage, essentially, and there is no electricity produced by that. It just simply flows down into the Gulf of Mexico. How much water is in that river? A lot of water. This morning, the, the flow rate at Simsport, Louisiana, where the Army Corps of Engineers has their gauge that measures this, was 1,898,500 gallons per second. <laughs> now, what we propose doing is taking 100,000, between 50 and 100,000 gallons per second of that and sending it west through a water conveyance system very similar to the Colorado River Aqueduct or the Central Arizona Project or the main 
uh, California aqueduct down the San Joaquin Valley and shipping it west across Louisiana, Texas, New Mexico, and directly to Glen Canyon Dam. Or the route that I personally prefer would be to try to send it to the Navajo Dam on the San Juan River, and the San Juan River feeds directly into Lake Powell. That route's 150 miles shorter, and I think it would help the Navajo Nation, which has control of that dam, or the dam is on their property. Now, what would it cost to do this? Most of it would be open channel, like the uh, California Aqueduct, but <clears throat> it's comparable sort of to building one half of an interstate highway. We spent $525 billion in 2022 dollars to build 49,000 miles of interstate highway, uh, 1,400, that's $11 million a mile. So a 1,400 mile aqueduct would cost roughly $15 billion. If you wanna calculate the cost another way, take the Colorado River Aqueduct, which was built in the 1930s and financed by, uh, and part of it was financed by the Reconstruction Finance Corporation and extrapolated to the 1,400 mile length of the proposed <clears throat> the water conveyance system, you're talking about $21 billion. So somewhere between $15 and $21 billion would be the cost to do this. This is a very small amount for a $5 trillion infrastructure bank, and I see no reason why it can't be done. And this would fix the problem on the Colorado River permanently. We may look out, and Mother Nature may continue to provide more snow to the western slope of the Rocky Mountains, but even if it snow like that for the next, it would take 10 years of that snow level that we had last winter on the west side of the Rockies to fill those two lakes. And the scientists simply do not believe it's going to happen. They believe that the uh, drought has uh, started in a permanent manner. So what can you do? Is there anyone listening to the sound of my voice? You can call your congressman or congresswoman and just make sure that they know that you want them to support the $5 trillion infrastructure bank. You may not be able to get them on the phone themselves, but they all have people that write down your name, phone number, and what you called about. So thank you very much. No, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that real quick. Uh, most people don't, are unaware that most of our food product comes from one area in California, and it's a very fragile food economy. Uh, we're not doing enough in terms of food security back here. Uh, and lastly, I want to bring on uh, Julie Olson uh, from Anchorage, Alaska, and she's going to wrap things up on the speakers. And we're going to have a, hopefully have a time for a few questions uh, afterwards. Thank you, Craig. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm Julie Olson. I'm a member of the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition, and it is my pleasure to be here this evening with you to chat about how the National Infra Infrastructure Bank can facilitate affordable housing into the future. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide after that. Okay, so first we want to assess the current state of our housing here in the US and we have huge needs. So approximately 2 million uh, homeless people currently, about half of them are in California and we have high numbers in my home states of Washington and Alaska. In addition, uh, another 10 to 15 percent of all Americans are uh, what we called, call housing insecure, and this means that they are paying more than 30 percent of their income for housing. Um, in a, now we look at some of the, the factors that contribute to uh, the, the level of homelessness, and of course there's low pay where the minimum wage has not kept up with inflation for the past uh, couple decades, and then of course high costs. And uh, the high costs have been exacerbated over the last few years with uh, the supply chain crisis and COVID. Uh, then we could blame some of it on Wall Street speculators buying up uh, uh, our housing stock, and we could blame it on Airbnb and vacation rentals pro proliferating around the country. But the net net of it is, is that our so housing supply is not keeping up with demand. And when supply does not keep up with demand, then prices go up. But the National Infrastructure Bank can help here. Uh, it can be used as a tool by local government, housing authorities, states to help provide the financing so that we can address this backlog of housing needs around the country. Now, in the US, public housing or the terminology public housing has kind of gotten a bad reputation. In fact, some of you may be shuddering when you hear that term public housing. And so really what we, we wanna talk about here is the new public housing model of the future and what uh, urban planners and futurists are calling it is social housing. 
And we're gonna do a deeper dive into that. Next slide, please. Okay, so what we would like to do is use the best models, of course, for social housing. In the past, our, uh, the policies that we've used for, for affordable housing haven't worked. Uh, we've had projects that have become ghettoized, so to speak. Um, and uh, today, the, the new normal is that 50% of our renters are cost burdened, i.e. paying more than 30% of their income on rent. And what that means is that those excess dollars that they're using to pay for rent are not being spent at the local coffee shop, at local restaurants, at the salon or the dog spa. And those dollars are not circulating around in our local economies and helping create that vibrancy uh, that we need to keep our cities and uh, communities uh, going. Um, so what we want to look at, the qualities that we want to look at in social housing are publicly owned housing projects uh, that are a mixed use type developments where higher rents are charged to higher income residents and those uh, higher rents are able to help subsidize the cost of low income housing. Many of these um, developments would also integrate commercial space and of course amenities. And the idea here is that instead of uh, public housing projects being a burden on cities and the federal government, that social housing can become self-sustaining. Uh, the photograph that you see here is uh, actually a picture of a public housing development in Vienna, Austria. And amazingly enough, in Austria, approximately six in Vienna, Austria, approximately 60% of the housing units are actually owned by the public. And many of these are beautiful historic buildings uh, like the one that you see in this photograph, but they also have new modern uh, housing developments. Typically, these developments are sustainable. They're integrated with mass transit types of uh, systems. They may have gardens, plazas, daycare, and social services, and, uh, and people want to live in them. They're attractive places to live. Uh, next slide, please. So really what we would like to see happen here in the US is that we go from NIMBY to YIMBY, and that's uh, to go from not in my backyard to yes in my backyard. And the idea is, is that these projects can be attractive projects that people in neighborhoods will say yes to because they're gonna bring, bring benefits and services and positive aspects to those local communities. And so if you look at the photographs on the left, we see something that you might uh, call the project. So these are unattractive places, they're depressing, they might be crime-ridden and full of junk cars and drugs and just generally unsafe places to live. No, nobody wants this in their backyard, right? And then look at the example on the right, uh, which I'm calling from slums to sky gardens in Singapore. So this is actually a public housing development in Singapore. What you see here is a 30 story building. It actually has rooftop gardens. And, and over on the right hand side, we see a plaza with a playground for kids. Very attractive, providing quality housing for residents in Singapore. Let's move on to the next slide. So, um, so some of the qualities that, that we feel are characterized in social public housing are quality design and construction. So this is really important is that um, uh, we have architects and engineers engaged in order to provide public housing that is going to be attractive and, that, and a place that people will want to, to live in over the long term. So around the, the country and, and of course around the world, there are design contests that are held on a regular basis um, and new construction techniques that are being developed, uh, for example, in things like modular construction that are uh, able to contribute to providing affordable housing that is actually affordable to build. And so those are the, you know, some of the qualities that we're looking for. Typically these, um, uh, complexes, these developments are going to have amenities. That's what people want. Tenants want these kinds of amenities. Various services like shopping and retail, childcare, uh, access to mass transit, access to trails and bike paths and parks and recreation. And of course, they want safety built into these complexes. Um, some of the, um, the newer complexes are built in an environmentally friendly manner and sustainability is an important quality. And by sustainability, uh, often what we're talking about here is projects that are built so that they require less maintenance. And of course, this will drive down the operating costs and make them again more affordable uh, to maintain over the long term. 
Uh, what we want to see in social housing is permanent affordability. In other words, places where people can get in and would be able to consider it their home for a year or five years, 10 years or 20 years, because the rent is going to be affordable for them on a fixed income or a lower income over the long term. And by keeping tenants in there over the long term, you're able to create a community essentially that cares about the place that they live. And this final quality is um, something that some people might consider a goal and others really just consider it an outcome of um, building complexes where you um, by design have mixed income uh, ranges and in the people who are living in, in those complexes. So a complex might go from um, uh, studio apartments to uh, one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom apartments. You might have apartments that are suitable for seniors, apartments that are suitable for people with disabilities. So just by design, you would have a variety of income ranges living there. And again, what this helps uh, do is ensure that these projects do not become ghettoized, so to speak. Again, creates a community, uh, a diverse community and uh, attractive for the neighborhood. Oh, uh, the other uh, uh, project that we see here on the right, again, this is another example from Vienna. Uh, includes about a thousand units in that modern development. And let's move on to the next page. So somehow uh, my slides have gotten, uh, the, the spacing is has gotten messed up somehow. However, um, I wanna talk about um, a, a housing authority that I'm very familiar with because it's from my hometown of Anchorage, Alaska. This is Cook Inlet Housing. Uh, they started in 1974. They're a public corporation, started in 1974 with a single residence. Then they moved on to providing housing, affordable housing for senior citizens. And today they're up to over 1,300 units of affordable housing. Um, in many of their um, developments, they do have a certain number of the apartments that are, so, are rented at market prices. In other words, not you know, your typical affordable or, or reduced income types of apartments. Uh, another one of their goals is uh, neighborhood revitalization. And by that, what they mean to do is go to a neighborhood that may need some economic uh, investment, uh, a lower income neighborhood, and try to uh, make an investment there that's really going to change the character of the neighborhood and draw in additional private development from private developers. So if you look at the building on the left, um, in, in this particular occasion, it was in a part of town that some people might call CD. And uh, this particular lot used to have a, a dilapidated, notorious strip club on it. And they bought the property and got rid of the strip club and put in this beautiful development that included 33 one bedroom units along with commercial space on the bottom floor. You know, they've got parking for the residents and for the businesses. And this is on a bus line close and within walking distance to a grocery store. So a very attractive development. If we look at the, um, the building on the right, this building is actually right across the street from the first building and they bought out an old gas station there, tore out the gas station, did the environmental remediation that was required to put up a beautiful new uh, apartment complex. And you look at a thing like this and a private developer not, might not be able to do that. They might not be able to justify the cost of doing the environmental remediation, but a company, or in a, a housing authority uh, is able to do that sort of thing. And again, make that dramatic improvement to the neighborhood that's gonna encourage private development to come in alongside it and um, do additional housing developments or commercial developments. And this really helps improve the, the tax base of that municipality or that city and, and uh, helps be able to um, help with the payment stream in terms of paying, paying the loans that they would uh, uh, get from a national infrastructure bank. And then the final photograph we see here is in another economically disadvantaged uh, neighborhood called Fairview. And here they, again, they bought a lot on a, right on a co busy commercial street, put in uh, a building with lofts up top and then commercial space on the bottom. So this is an example of a very successful housing authority that is doing attractive um, attractive housing projects right now, they actually run waiting lists of people who want to get into their projects because they are quality developments. And if we can do it in Anchorage, Alaska, I think we can do it around the country. Next slide, please. So some additional examples here to look at. 
Um, Seattle has a very robust housing authority. This is an example um, of a neighborhood that was redeveloped. Um, they ended up with something like 1600 residences. And you, you can see that public housing does not just need to be a high rise apartment building. It can be uh, very attractive, single family, duplex, triplex type residences. Um, then uh, the photograph on the right is actually an architect's rendering uh, that won a design competition recently in Finland for uh, a new housing complex and a church actually are going to be uh, in that particular site. But if you were to Google Finland and housing, you would see headlines like the one you see here. It's a miracle. Helsinki's radical solution to homelessness. And in fact, in the EU, uh, Finland is the only EU uh, country where the rates of homelessness are declining, and it's because they have this approach and they are funding public housing projects in Finland. And so I think it's really encouraging when we look at that because uh, Finland is not exactly like we think of them as an economic powerhouse, yet they've been able to implement uh, these types of public housing projects um, in Finland. And I believe in Helsinki, they're up to something like 60,000 units of publicly owned housing. Uh, next slide, please. Here's another uh, great example here in the US, and this is repurposing of an existing building to provide housing. So as reported in the uh, Los Angeles uh, Times, uh, the Los Angeles General Hospital, you see a picture here. This is actually the hospital that was in the soap opera, General Hospital. And uh, it's been vacant for 14 years. It's actually owned by LA County and is now undergoing redevelopment into a future, uh, what they're calling healthy village. It's going to include 1400 units of housing, uh, medical and mental health care, uh, space for amenities, social services, the arts, retail, community, outdoor activities, and that sort of thing. And then the county apparently owns another uh, eight acre site next door that where they're putting in a restorative care village that will have short term and permanent housing. So um, now it, it is taking taken LA County years to do this development. And of course, one of the challenges is getting the financing. And so oftentimes, whether you're a county or whether you're a private developer trying to provide low income housing, you're having to cobble together financing or, or money from various sources. And what a national infrastructure bank would do is provide another source of funding and hopefully an easier source of funding to be able to facilitate these types of projects so that they would have an easier time in taking uh, facilities like this and creating housing. Next slide, please. Uh, here's another uh, trend that we see going on, and this is the conversion of excess office and, and other types of buildings like the hospital we just looked at into housing. And if we look at the uh, pictures here on the right, um, I've got an example from San Francisco, a 70s office tower that was turned into housing. And then uh, this beautiful building, the Tribune Tower, which is the famous home of the Chicago Tribune, was converted into condos in 2021. Now, I do want to say that that is not affordable housing for most of us. However, the private sector has been able to take some of these buildings and repurpose them into attractive, attractive housing. Uh, as I understand it, the condos in that Tribune Tower are selling for millions of dollars. So again, these are, you know, these are attractive facilities in great locations and they're repurposing our existing housing stock. And uh, Chicago actually has many, many uh, kind of uh, early 20th century buildings that are available to be repurposed. Now there's, you know, there's some challenges that are involved in uh, converting excess office uh, buildings into housing. So, um, you know, the pros here are that there's there's a glut of office space on the market today. So um, depending on the market you're in, people are saying 17 to 20 some percent of office space is currently vacant because of the uh, trend of re remote work. And what this means is that um, there's there are currently and will be more uh, distressed commercial mortgages, which is going to lead to lower property costs for local entities or housing authorities that wanted to acquire those buildings on the cheap. And many communities are actually discussing uh, these opportunities right now, including New York City, Boston, Pittsburgh, San Francisco, LA, Seattle. So this is something that is happening around the country right now. And of course, there are challenges with this, which include uh, you might have to get zoning and code changes. 
And certainly this is something where a national infrastructure bank could be very helpful in terms of the types of changes that we would need to see in zoning and building codes in order to facilitate these types of developments. Uh, one example here is that in office buildings, typically the utilities run up through the, the center of the building. And if you've got multiple apartments per floor, then those utilities are going to have to be run out to the, the various units on each floor. So that, you know, that's a project and that can, can run into money. Um, another challenge for some very large, uh, more modern office buildings is the ability to have windows in every unit. So um, architects and designers are figuring out ways to bring in natural light to, um, to some of these buildings that are being repurposed. And then of course, cost, it's always a, a challenge. However, um, uh, people are doing it today. And with the financing available through a national infrastructure bank, we could see more successful public housing projects uh, like this. Next slide, please. Um, so one of the other trends that we see is um, there are two sort of countervailing trends. On the one hand, many people from suburbia or more rural communities may want to move into the big city to be able to take advantage of big city amenities. Then there are those millennials and remote workers who want to get out of big cities and want to get away from the congestion and the high costs and, and lack of housing in big cities and move out to the suburbs. However, they want the same amenities that they had in the big city back in the suburbs. In other words, they want to create more of a sense of place in those suburbs. And um, uh, for those of you who live in big cities, I know sometimes it seems like the only, the only way that you can tell that you've gone from one uh, suburb to another is uh, the color of the street signs have, have changed, but otherwise they all look the same. And so what we have the ability to do here with investment in public infrastructure is to create vibrant downtowns or city centers in these suburbs. Um, what millennials and others look, moving out to the suburbs are looking for are affordable housing and amenities within walking distance. They want what is called live, work, and walk neighborhoods. You know, a place where they can live, go to work, and walk to the grocery store that doesn't necessarily require a car. Or if you're um, a, a couple, a, a two adult family, it doesn't require two cars in order to get around. Um, so these kinds of developments are enabled by. Uh, investments in mass transit. And this goes along with what uh, Dr. Metcalf had been talking about earlier, which is that when you put in mass transit, the private development will follow it. And one of my favorite examples comes from Seattle. And uh, what, you, what you see here on the right is uh, the, uh, the, the map schedule for the light rail system in Seattle that goes from SeaTac, the airport there, um, through downtown, uh, through the University of Washington, and then heads up north. And they are currently in the process of expanding the light rail up to a, a, what I consider to be a really boring suburb called Linwood. And what is happening in Linwood is that they are taking a huge parking lot that is surrounding the Alderwood Mall and building huge apartment complexes on it. And this again is, is uh, doing multiple things. It's helping to create a city center uh, there in Linwood. It's bringing a steady stream of new customers to a mall. And as we know, many malls are in danger of going out of business these days because of the changes in shopping hab uh, habits. And um, so, so if, if you were to take the light rail um, out of the Seattle airport at every stop along, this way, uh, along the way, you would see new housing developments springing up, new commercial developments, revitalized neighborhoods, uh, new investments in private homes and that sort of thing. So it's a great example of how if we make that investment in public infrastructure here in mass transit types of facilities, that the that there's plenty of opportunity for private developers to come in also and participate in the economic development that comes along with enabling mass transit. Next slide, please. And Julie, I'll try to yeah, summarize this very quickly so we get some Q&A in. Okay, so the summary is, in our country, we have the expertise and the experience, and if we can only get NIB financing, we can build a lot more public housing for the future. So thank you, everyone. Yeah, I think we're just going to go to the Q&A, um, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, we've got Joe Polito up. Hello. Um, that was terrific. What, what a group of presentations. Just fantastic, inspiring. Um, a quick question for Alfeca, I think, uh, maybe two. 
One, uh, she mentioned $500 billion to create a $5 trillion uh, borrowing capacity and lending capacity. Is that based on capital adequacy or the uh, reserve ratio? And secondly, um, is there an estimate as to how much of this money would be borrowed by uh, some level of government versus uh, some level of the private sector, sector to increase their capacity to do the projects? Thanks very much. So those are great questions. Thank you very much, Joe. So for the, as to the first question, uh, we are going to uh, raise altogether 500 billion in capital so that we can lend out 5 trillion in project loans. And uh, that's because banks are required to maintain on their books a dollar in capital for every $10 in loans that they give out. That's a separate ratio from the deposit reserve ratio, uh, which is not even law anymore, but banks do it, you know, keep it anyway. Um, but the, the bottom line is this is the Alexander Hamilton method of capitalizing a bank by going to this pool of money, which is in the form of treasuries held by the private sector to see if they would be interested in capitalizing. And then that bank, that that capital sits on the bank's books, not used up in any way. And then the bank goes on to give out loans exactly like a commercial bank, creating new money supply as it's doing the loan. So that's the first question. The second question is uh, um, the, um, are we, are we uh, sort of, I, I think this is the question, are we lending to um, public private partnership type uh, uh, projects or are we lending strictly to the public sector? Um, our analysis of financing infrastructure projects, and by that uh, we are defining infrastructure to be mostly publicly owned infrastructure. That is, it excludes the infrastructure that companies own, that they, you know, their machinery and those kinds of things. This is publicly owned infrastructure. So for that reason, it's roads, bridges, schools, the kinds of things that the American Society of Civil Engineers attracts. Um, but it also includes things that are already public private, like airports. I was surprised to know that airports are owned by the local um, governing uh, jurisdiction, but they are composed of lots of pub, uh, private enterprise parts to them. And when they undergo a refurbishment, for example, JFK uh, just got a refurbishment airport in New York, uh, that's, they take out a loan as a public-private partnership. Uh, they collect against that loan the fees from the airlines coming into the airport, or the, con the set concessionary fees uh, that are for the restaurants that are located inside the airport. And then that pays for new runways and that kind of thing. Our bank is really interested in making sure that we get financing, infrastructure financing money to the parts of the country that haven't received it already. For the most part, that are they are the local governments that own public infrastructure. They're the ones that haven't gotten their financing. Um, if DOT, US DOT sends some money to the state of Pennsylvania, for example, it'll fix the state of Pennsylvania's own bridges, but Pittsburgh's bridges that Pittsburgh, the city of Pittsburgh owns, they never get fixed. And so uh, we want to really emphasize getting financing. And the way to do that is to let Pittsburgh or anybody that owns infrastructure come in for a loan. However, we will also entertain public-private partnerships of the kind that Dr. Metcalf is talking about to uh, you know, really incentivize high-speed rail. Uh, and that could take several forms. It could be um, a, a true public-private partnership type of a deal, or it could be that the actual entity, the government entity, is going into the real estate business. Uh, and I think that King's Cross Station was really interesting. I mean, he didn't describe it today, but I've heard him talk about it before, where he said that the actual the government went into the real estate business, got into the business of the real estate 
uh, um, that was around King's Cross. And uh, I don't know if they finally sold it or not, but uh, they were in the business of, you know, creating hotels and things like that around that train station, which really made the whole project go. So we could do a whole suite of things. For the most part, we'll be lending to public entities that own public infrastructure. Thanks. Terrific answer. Thanks so much. John, do you, John, do you want to introduce yourself? John, answer? Yes. Okay. Hi. Well, uh, first of all, I had great presentations this evening. I had a question which is kind of double barreled, which is directed both at Nomi and then uh, perhaps, well, anyone else who wants to answer, it has to do with the housing because I think uh, over a long period of time, what many people on the calls have seen is that a great crisis also creates an opportunity in terms of getting large scale changes in our public policy. And uh, certainly from what Nomi was indicating in her presentation, we're gonna have uh, an ongoing banking crisis. So what I'm asking is, the middle tier banks, which I was a little bit surprised about, many of them are heavily involved in commercial real estate, uh, and which Julie indicated this is a big problem right now because a lot of the tenancy in these major office buildings has collapsed uh, or declined in, in incredibly uh, as a result of COVID, the move towards remote, et cetera. Can we put together the uh, you know the kind of impending crisis, which is going to hit, I think, a larger swath of the banking sector, and maybe there are derivatives connected to that. With the fact that I think it's very clear that there are going to be a large number of these kinds of buildings to convert into housing. In other words, is this one way that we can take the crisis and take, turn that into an opportunity? So as I said, it's kind of a, a doubly directed question to Naomi and maybe Julie. I'll say that I think in every crisis there's opportunities, and and you know it sounds maybe crass, but there are winners and there are losers. And so I think that what needs to happen here is that um, local governments and housing authorities need to position themselves to be able to take advantage of these opportunities that undoubtedly will be coming up, and um, and we need to be thinking ahead. Um, that that these possibilities will be there and planning so that if a uh, a building comes up in in a city or a town where there's an urgent need for housing, that uh, a local housing authority be empowered to be able to purchase that building and and be prepared to work with local uh, government to change the zoning or the building codes in order to be able to repurpose that building. So. Um, yeah, uh, you know what's I, I mean I, I am not in favor of uh, additional banks going out of business, but if it does happen, we should be prepared to deal with it. You know, Nomi, do you have? Yeah, and I, I'd love your presentation, Julie. I mean, it just shows that mostly we can go around the world, but even in this country, we we, we can move forward um, with the right with the right funding, which is the entire crux of this point. And, and John, um, to add on to Julie and got to your question, the reality is this, if, if there are banks that are suffering from loan degradations that cannot liquidate any kind of capital that they have, and therefore either have to go under or be bought by other banks, the idea of having a public a national infrastructure bank is to be able to fund that shortfall without having to deplete the FDIC, without the Fed having to, um, for lack of a better term, print extra money as they did when Silicon Valley Bank went under to the tune of $300 billion. Um, and those mid-tier banks are facing a $700 billion shortfall today. This just goes back to, um, and I think Stan said, you know, infrastructure, why? And it's sort of like, why not now, um, the NIB, right? Because we, we're, we're getting into an extended set of circumstances including housing, where um, we, we can't fund the transition, we can't fund the public infrastructure transition, and no private bank, certainly not JP Morgan taking over First Republic, is going to be like, you know, thanks a lot for the deposits, by the way, how about I fund some social housing in like, you know, Cleveland, or it's just not going to happen. And this is where, from a financial standpoint, the uh, talking about the ratios, um, you know, a 10 to 1 ratio is is efficient enough to be solid enough for this bank to continue to perform the National Infrastructure Bank in order to be able to position itself to these opportunities. And they are part of the, you know, $5 trillion cutout that goes to one of um, Alfeca's slides. And everybody here has so many massive, awesome projects to fit into that cutout. But, you know, this 
multi hundred billion to housing, this multi hundred billion to electric infrastructure, this multi hundred billion to broadband. That it's kind of all part of fusing into that. Um, but setting up financing, um, and I think Stan says it, in totality for what we need, including the elements of housing, and being able to be there to finance economic development instead of bailing out banks or giving them to JP Morgan to do whatever with. Me, you want to go next? Lee Stanfield, you get your hand up next. Just unmute yourself. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, um, please forgive my ignorance of the details of the financial sector. Um, I'm not that savvy about that, but I'm hoping that what you're describing is a national infrastructure bank that would be entirely publicly owned. Is that what you're suggesting? And if so, what does capitalizing that bank mean? How would the bank be publicly owned if the capital for it is coming from the private sector? Do you, do you want me to take that one, Craig? Yeah, please, okay, quick. sure. So this uh, in the statute, this bank is incorporated under something called the US Government Corporations Act. You could look that up on Wikipedia if you're interested. Um, under that US Government Corporations Act, there are about 35 different government owned institutions and it can be a range of ownership. It can range all the way from 100% government ownership all the way over to even private ownership, but government sponsored. This particular national infrastructure bank would be what's called a mixed ownership because it is capitalized using treasuries from the private sector. That's the investment from the private sector that's part of the ownership of the bank. They're taking an equity stake in the bank, um, but it is a government sponsored bank. And so it's called a government public, US publicly owned uh, institution for that reason. So uh, the, I, would, I would point out too that those investors, those private investors who sell in their treasuries uh, in exchange for preferred stock, they become then silent partners in the bank. That means they have no voting rights, nor that do they get any dividends other than uh, the, 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 the secure dividend that is promised to them when they sell their treasuries in. So um, they're silent partners in the bank. And then the operations of the bank are directed by the statute itself. That means that the government has uh, vetted this statute, has decided that this is the way that the um, government bank will be giving out loans for these kinds of infrastructure projects. And it makes sure that the bank stays on track to do what it's supposed to do. Um, thank you. I, I guess I'm concerned about that. Um, I, I know that, and, and thank you for describing, you know, the silent partner thing, but I don't trust that. <laughs> Knowing capitalism and how things have happened, um, I don't think that's enough of a safeguard. I would want this to be a completely publicly owned bank. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for your input. Appreciate it. So up next, I've got Randy Ryan. Oh, sure. Uh, thanks, everybody. Um, uh, I have a couple of questions and um, that are related and a comment. Uh, the comment is uh, a few years back during COVID, King County, which is one of the largest counties in the country, started buying distressed hotels for uh, to uh, house homeless people. Um, it's been a very successful um, uh, partial fix on this and it's uh, uh, it's being expanded now. So uh, yeah, there's the, um, there, there is some interest in doing that. On to the questions. Um, the first, and I'll, I'll just give you all three questions at once. The first is how is power generation not infrastructure? Um, I, I don't quite get that because there are many uh, publicly owned utilities that own power generation. Uh, the second is would power storage be considered infrastructure under this bank? And the, the final is um, this is important because uh, actually we do have a significant amount of uh, 
uh, of green energy being produced, uh, Iowa may hit 50% uh, electrical generation by wind this year, and Texas already exceeds 50, uh, 20%. Anybody? Is that, is that what you got, Randy? Yeah. Yeah, uh, Sam, you want to handle the power generation storage, please? How about I, I, I jump in on that one? Uh, yeah, power power generation <laughs> is infrastructure. I, I believe I said that. It, it is ah, infrastructure. Okay, and uh, the storage of energy is also infrastructure. Is that, is that the way? Is that that's the way you ordered your questions? Is that what you really wanted to know? Um, those, um, those, those are those, those are critical. We have several potential projects uh, in this state for uh, for energy storage, although involving water. But there are many ways of storing energy without using lithium batteries. That's true. Yep. That's true. But it's still a very large facility that has to be built. Yeah, which is which is why uh, which is why some of this uh, 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 of this uh, bank would be ideal for uh, yes for dealing with it. Yeah. Yes. I think the real problem and things that have to be considered because when I was with Amtrak, uh, we were considering it uh, for a lot of reasons. But the problem we always wound up with is, uh, as you're probably aware, a, a railroad uh, is, is all land that is 50 yards or 75 yards wide and goes mile after mile after mile. So there's not a lot of room to put up large facilities for storage. Uh, that's right, because you're probably back east. Um, out here in the two thirds of the country, we're, you're right. You're yeah. right, and uh, and it's it's important because the city of Seattle has used uh, pumped hydro for about a hundred years now to to, to handle the um, the evening surge in um, in power consumption. Um, it just needs to be expanded. Expanded. Yeah, and and, and yeah, that that pump storage. Uh, uh, one of the utilities here in uh, eastern Pennsylvania has a facility that does that. Uh, and, and that's a little bit different than actually having uh, a, a building that would store electricity. It's a little bit different. But yes, you're right. You, it's, yeah. it's, it's different out where you're at than here on the East Coast. Yeah, yeah, you're a little more crowded there. Yeah. Although the Seattle area is getting horribly crowded. It, also, <laughs> thank every, you. Every place is. Every place is. Yeah. Does that answer thank your you. questions? Is that is that okay, Randy? Yes, it does. It answers them completely and uh, very well. I'm uh, I'm very happy with that answer. Good. To ask you something with respect to power generation in Europe. How are they handling that? For instance, with the TGV system uh, in uh, France. Well, I think uh, originally the plan was to have very large uh, nuclear uh, support for the power systems, but uh, I think there's been a certain backing off, just as there was in the U.S., when it was recognized that there were significant issues associated with it. But, uh, yeah, they have a higher proportion of nuclear than I think any other countries in the EU. Uh, the one thing that I would add... Uh, to that is uh, in France and in England and other countries in Europe, insofar as how they actually move their power to get to the train. Uh, Amtrak is a little bit different because Amtrak economically dispatches the power through its own transmission lines, whereas uh, oh. France and England don't do things like that. No, no. That's correct. Yeah. Andrew, you're up. Thanks, Craig. I have a quick comment for Craig, uh, Dr. Metcalf, and uh, Mr. Forsek. My first comment relates to Ohio. I live in Canton right now, and um, we had a mayoral contest here that had six Democrats. So since January, we've had robust discussion. Our young people are leaving Ohio, as I think you know, Craig, 
to find jobs elsewhere. So part of our discussion was how do we keep our young people here in Ohio? And a train was the answer. We've got to get the people out of Canton and the kids have to be able to uh, easily get to Akron and Cleveland. And then after we do that, they have to be able to easily go to Dayton and Columbus and Cincinnati. So that's my comment for you. It's been a discussion here since January. And then I just wanted to share with Dr. Metcalf and Stanley that I lived in Schenectady for a while. And when GE uh, let a lot of workers go there, the neighborhoods fell into just uh, a deplorable, deplorable uh, uh, condition. And I, uh, Dr. Metcalf's presentation just hit home with me because the Amtrak station there was restored and it generated a renaissance in the area around the station. There's shops, there's restaurants. It's incredible. You can go online and look at the new Amtrak station in Schenectady and it's gorgeous. And it did so much for the neighborhood. So Dr. Metcalf's um, you know, comments in that regard uh, really hit home for me. Thanks, Aaron, Andrew. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, again, going back to my earlier comment about we used to have the largest pa uh, passenger rail system here. In Ohio, particularly, you, you may recall that we had the interurban, and the interurban system was a two to three car uh, trolley that connected Canton, Akron, and Cleveland, and many other uh, municipalities across the state. And that's something that, you know, one of the things that we've lost. So, uh, you know, thanks for that. Um, Lee, I know I see your hand back up, but I want to go to, uh, let me go to Diana Smith, please. Diana. Hello. Um, I have a question for Dr. Metcalf about the water project. Um, if it was, was it Dr. Metcalf? Anyway, the, um, I have seen some other pre discussions of getting water from the east uh, to Lake Powell and Lake Mead. And they all seem to think it's unfeasible because of the power demands of uh, raising the water from what's essentially sea level up to a mile high or greater going over the continental divide. And I was wondering how they visualized that. I mean, the source of the water is clear, but how, how do the power generation in order to move it? Yeah. But I'd like to actually have Don Sifkis to handle that, if you don't mind, Dr. Metcalf. No, whoever. Yeah, let me, let me, uh, I'll comment on that. You, what you would do, look, the Army Corps of Engineers would have to figure it out, but I can tell you, it will take exactly 64 billion kilowatt hours of electricity to lift 5.7 trillion gallons of water up to the Lake Powell from Simsport, that's 3,500 feet. Now, six, that's not 64 billion kilowatt hours all at once. That's over the time period that you would lift that water. We use 4,000, we use 4 trillion or 4,000 billion kilowatt hours a year of electricity in the United States. So we're not talking about a huge percentage. Right now, what we're doing in the United States is we are burning every year 60 billion kilowatt hours to mine bitcoin <laughs> okay so yeah. we're talking about moving water up to lake powell 3500 feet high using the same amount of electricity as bitcoin but remember we're basically suggesting that we build a 1400 mile pumped hydro storage system instead of having the water close to the dam we're just going to pump it up there you'll get back 85 to 90 percent of that electricity when that water comes back down. Now, to ask how you do it, I would do it with Texas sometimes produces so much power with wind, they don't know what to do with it. So it gets lost, okay, or the turbines just don't spin. These megapack batteries that Mr. Metcalf talked about and uh, that Forsec talked about are becoming more and more efficient. Lithium iron, I-R-O-N, storage batteries, those things can hold 4,000 kilowatt hours. You have those standing around, you charge those with wind, you 24 seven. You can use them if the sun shines during the day directly to the pumps, but at night you could use the megapack battery storage. So uh, that's how you would do it. And really it's a pretty small, 
uh, amount of uh, electricity percentage-wise that we actually use. Remember, the deal is you can't let Lake Powell and Lake Mead go down because that means no electricity. No electricity means no pumps. No pumps means no water. It also means no gasoline because you need pump electricity to get gasoline out of the ground. And eventually it means no water, no electricity, no pumps, no food, eventually no us. That's the problem. So I, uh, I think it can be done, but there has to be some work done with the advances in electricity and the, uh, no, you don't have to do it. They know how to make mega pack batteries now. It's just a question of building the things, but you don't want the kind of lithium batteries that go into a car. You want these storage batteries that are made with iron phosphate instead of cobalt. That's very important. Though, enough said. Good question. Thank you. I think we're going to uh, wrap this uh, baby up here. Uh, so if we could have the slides. And just real quickly, we're just going to go through. Uh, this is a grassroots movement to keep in mind. We, we are obviously lobbying Congress to pass the National Infrastructure Bank, but it also starts with the localities and the states that we've been going through. Uh, the National Infrastructure Bank people have been meeting constantly with, with folks from all over the country. Uh, in fact, uh, we're doing something in Ohio where we're going to have a resolution soon to be uh, in the committee, I believe, for debate in the Ohio House, which is supporting the National Infrastructure Bank. So, uh, yeah, as you can see from the slides, these are all the different places, uh, the states, uh, particularly uh, city councils, all pushing for the adoption of this bank because they clearly see it from especially local officials see it better than anybody because we, we've got the wish list they, they need to have a lot of things done particularly with the housing demolition um broadband <laughs> transportation like we talked about so it's 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 great to see that this coalition is coming together but it takes all of us this is a volunteer group um they work extremely hard day in and day out to meet with uh, officials from across the country and to try to get this baby uh, officially passed in Congress. This time has come. Uh, I, I always talk about this, um, that when I was campaigning for Congress and for State Senate, it is a question of our generation, the boomers, who went bust this last 40 years, because I always thought, you know, after you see in the video with the TVA and everything else, that. You know what, what they did in the, back then that they were the greatest generation of course they were i thought we were going to be the best generation we were going to better them so it's incumbent upon us now to leave it better behind and i, I think the national infrastructure bank is clearly the vehicle to do that um so they rely you know the nifa relies on uh Funding. This is a volunteer group, but it takes donations to make all these th presentations go. Uh, the wheels behind it, the, the, the technology and everything else that goes into it. So uh, if you are really into this uh, and want to support this movement, see it as this is now the time. Again, going back to leaving it better behind. This is our generation's call. Please visit the page, NIB. Donate, do it on a recurring basis if you can, because that's the best. And as a former candidate, I always love the recurring donations. But it's it gives the you know the group the ability to keep at it because as you can see from the politicians in Congress, they're arguing about a bunch of nothing. At the debt ceiling, it's it's this is crazy talk. They, 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 all these things that we're going to lose if we go into austerity for the next ten years, like we did after the last bank crash we're gonna fall that much further behind. So this is really uh, critical right now for the NIB. Please take a look at the, the website, go to the Facebook page, Twitter, email, but please consider becoming a good supporter for this bank. And I appreciate you guys taking the time to listen to the presentations. I appreciate all the presenters. I am very honored to, to have been asked to, uh, to moderate tonight and I can't uh, thank the people enough to, for asking me.